Danielle, and I am a descendant of slaves. One of the great gifts that my husband has given to me, he's given me many, but one of them is that he enjoys researching family history. He enjoys going online and looking for information from the census records and from other online genealogies. And I remember one day I was working in the kitchen, probably doing the dishes, and he called me excitedly from the next room and said, come see what I just found. I knew he was doing some research. He was excited to show me a bill of sale. Someone named Mr. Luckadoo, around 1863, had passed away, and his property was being sold off. On the list include items like a barrel, several books, and three people. One of them, it just says, a boy named Sam, $1,800. Now, we're still piecing together some of the aspects of the history, but we believe that this person, Sam, who lived on Mr. Luckadoo's farm, was one of my direct ancestors. And I have to say that I get excited with my husband when we find these pieces of history, these clues that help me think about my identity in the world. But as I stood there and, and looked at this particular paper on which I saw clear evidence of the sale of someone in my family, I felt physical pain. I felt that again this morning as I prepared to share this with you. My family, we come from slaves. But they were slaves who were tinkerers and farmers and people who dreamed and hoped. And how do I know that? <laughs> because they were humans, and this is what all humans do. My name is Danielle, and I'm a descendant of slaves. Sometimes I feel like a mother let child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. A long way from home. A long way from home. Now, I don't have any records from my ancestor, Sam. I don't know what he thought about, but I'm thankful that we have some writing from people that lived in slavery, and I want to highlight a poem by someone named George Moses Horton, who was born and lived as a slave, but also earned the right through his money as a writer uh, to actually buy his time and spend time creating poetry. I enjoy his piece called George Moses Horton, Myself. I feel myself in need of the inspiring strains of ancient lore, my heart to lift, 
my empty mind to feed, and all the world to explore. I know that I am old and never can recover what is past, but for the future may some light unfold and soar from age's blast. I feel resolved to try, my wish to prove, my calling to pursue, or mount up from the earth into the sky to show what heaven can do. Oh, freedom, oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me. And before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Hello, my name is Danielle Wood, and I serve on faculty at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I lead a research group there called Space Enabled, and we are working to ensure that technology from space is part of our tool set to address the most important challenges of our generation. Our message to the world is that there are six technologies from space that are already being used to support sustainable development, but there's work to be done because we want to make sure these technologies are accessible and affordable. Our mission, as you heard, is to advance justice in Earth's complex systems using designs enabled by space. Now, justice for us has two ideas. The first idea is that a just world is one in which we are meeting the sustainable development goals. Are any of you following the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? I see some hands. I hope that you looked them up because the Sustainable Development Goals is a list of key objectives that every country has agreed to pursue between now and 2030. And they really highlight the key challenges of our era and the things that we can use technology to help improve. Areas such as ensuring that we're reducing poverty, ensuring that everyone has access to clean food and water, and that everyone has access to health care. In addition to these basic goals, it also has ideas around the systems that make up our society. Questions such as, how do we ensure that our cities, like this amazing city in Chicago, are sustainable and equitable? How do we ensure that our global production system is sustainable in terms of our packaging and our sourcing and even our labor? There's also key ideas around gender equality and economic equality for all. Of course, it also includes the environment, ensuring we maintain biodiversity and address climate change. Now, technology from space is already being used to help meet these goals, but as I talk to leaders who are in development areas around the world, they see that there's still frustrations that affect their ability to use these goals. Now, in particular, I mentioned there's six technologies from space, and these include the following. Satellites to observe the Earth, satellites for communication and positioning, as well as satellites for uh, other services. We can also think about other fields, including microgravity research and the knowledge we gain from human spaceflight, technology transfer from space to other fields, as well as fundamental research in space, including areas such as astronomy and astrophysics. In order for our team to do our work, we partner directly with leaders, such as those in the United Nations and other international agencies, as well as those at national governments, local and regional governments, as well as university professors and entrepreneurs. Anyone who is thinking about how their research and work can support the Sustainable Development Goals, we ask how we can use space technology as part of their activities. As many of you will recall, some of the early space activities, especially by the United States and the Soviet Union, were done as a bit of a race or competition to show that their way of life, that capitalism or socialism, were more dominant and effective. We can also highlight that in the beginning of the space era, especially during the 40s and 50s when the early research was being done, it was a time of blatant racism and colonialism. It was a time when many countries, especially those in Africa, were currently being occupied by colonial powers, and a time when segregation was legal in the United States. So on one hand, we can ask, what is the basis of the thinking that goes into space technology? It was not born in a cradle of equality. We can think about this data point that between the year of the founding of NASA in 1958 and the landing of the Apollo crew in 1969, 34 countries in Africa gained independence from European countries. It's a time of great upheaval and change. So 
So despite this reality that colonialism and racism were rampant, they were those who had a counter view. And they immediately, at the beginning of the space era, asked, what does it mean for humanity to be acting in space? And for whom will this bring benefit? They gathered through the United Nations and formed a committee called the Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space. This committee continues to operate. And this team of people from countries all over the world gradually formed several treaties. The first was called the Outer Space Treaty. In 1967, it set forth a very anti-racist way of thinking about space, one that was not concerned about hierarchies among countries and among peoples. They stated that the exploration and use of outer space shall be carried out for the benefit and in the interest of all countries, irrespective of their degree of economic or scientific development. Space was meant to be for the province of all humankind, which means that we should ask the question today, are we living up to this legacy? Now we know from the work of historians like Margot Lee Shetterly and her work in bringing us the story of the hidden figures that there were people of all different backgrounds involved with our early space achievements. African-American women were some of the early computer scientists helping NASA achieve their goals of putting people on space. They didn't always get credit for the work, but they were there. And so even as the space era continued, we saw more and more people getting visible roles, sometimes one at a time or two at a time. Children, go where I send thee. How shall I send thee? I'm gonna send you one by one, one for the little bitty baby born, born, born in Bethlehem. Children, go where I send thee. How shall I send thee? I'm gonna send thee two by two, two for Paul and Silas, born, born, born in Bethlehem. If we continue to reflect on the history of the space era, we see after the Apollo program, programs that started to open the doors for more people to be involved. Thinking about the space shuttle era, now more people can fit onto a space mission, up to seven. And finally, in the International Space Station is the project of the 80s and the 90s. Now we're inviting, as the United States, many other countries to participate. So around 15 countries come together, making a treaty to work together on the space station. It's completed around 2010, and since that time, over 100 countries have had some role doing scientific research, educational activities, or some experiment on the space station. So we can see that this pattern of opening space and having more and more participants has been growing. And meanwhile, many countries have created their own space activity and done that from their national programs. Right now, we see some exciting movements. One of them is represented by the concept of the small satellite. Traditionally, as government programs build very important satellites that are designed for scientific research, their tradition has been to build them as large as possible with as many instruments as possible because they're the kind that can be used uh, for many months, maybe many years, and they can be highly reliable. They're tested carefully, and all this careful engineering means that they're also very expensive. The small satellite philosophy takes the opposite approach. Rather than building a large satellite to last for many years, the goal is instead to build a smaller satellite, about the size of a toaster, that will last perhaps just one year and carry maybe only one instrument, like a camera or a sensor. Now, these smaller satellites, rather than costing billions or perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars, can come down to the cost of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And this means that countries around the world and companies that have new business ideas can afford to build and operate their own spacecraft with clever and unique ways. We can also ask how these combinations of satellites can work together to make new kind of missions possible. So space was not born in a cradle of equality, but movements such as small satellite activities, as well as the gradual opening of space cooperation by countries around the world, they are bringing kind of a new era. And my team, we asked how we can redeem the early legacies of, of racism and colonialism or part of the early years of space. And we work alongside leaders, and we bring together people from several backgrounds in terms of disciplines. So I lead a team of about 10 graduate students, several undergrads, and several staff. And we come from six areas, including design thinking, art, and social science, as well as those who are on the technical side with tools such as complex system modeling, those who are working on building and operating satellites, and computer science. We think that we need this whole range of ways of thinking to address these important issues I just highlighted earlier from the Sustainable Development Goals. 
No one way of thinking or one discipline can really address these important goals. So over the next few minutes, I'll give you a few examples of the projects that you can see around the world using space technology to support development. But I'll also highlight a few of the projects that my team is starting here in our first year. Are you ready? Good, excellent. My way is cloudy, my way, my way is cloudy, my way, my way is cloudy, send your angels down. One of the opportunities to use space technology to support human needs is to combine the three services I mentioned from satellites earlier. I mentioned satellites for observing the environment, satellites for communication, and satellites for positioning and navigation. Often when all three tools are brought together, we get the most benefit from space. And this can be applied in areas like disaster response, addressing questions such as how we manage our water resources, or thinking about food security and agriculture. Just to give you a few examples, here in the United States, we have several government agencies working on a food, uh, food and uh, agricultural warning system. It's called FUSENET, the Famine Early Warning System. You see cooperation from NASA, from the United States Geological Survey, and our Agency for International Development. They use data from NASA satellites to understand what's the state of crops by looking at vegetation health, looking at the rainfall and soil moisture, and using that with computer models to predict where you're going to have healthy crops or crops that might need some uh, challenges. And this means that before there's a major hurt, a concern, there's an opportunity to provide food aid or plan for how we're going to make sure people have access to food. You can also think about it even in the way we use hurricane warnings here in the US. There are weather satellites that give us these amazing images of, of hurricanes and typhoons forming in the ocean. And often during the actual storm and during the time of recovery, we know there's areas where communication systems are broken down and where we may need to update our maps to figure out where people are in danger or where the infrastructure has been affected. So in all these areas, having satellites to give us pictures and imagery and measurements, as well as having communication systems that are not affected by the storm, if we can put a new antenna in place, we can temp temporarily have access to satellite-based communication. And finally, we might need to ask, uh, can we map exactly from positioning data where all the people are that need help? Another good example is thinking about public health. If you're aware of some of the mosquito-borne illnesses, you know that mosquitoes like to live in a certain environment where it's warm and moist. We can use data from satellites to determine which areas are most likely to breed mosquitoes. And we can use computer models given to us by scientists who understand mosquito behavior. So that's stage one. Your model should also ask, where are people living in relation to where the mosquitoes might be active? And finally, you should ask the doctors and nurses, where have we seen recent cases of malaria? Because mosquitoes carry the cases from one person to another. If you can build a model with all this information, you should also then take some pictures from satellite to see exactly where the houses are currently and to have the latest information about where people are moving around. Finally, from there, you should ask, can we then check who is providing services? Some people may be providing bed nets affected uh, with a spray to reduce mosquito activity. Others are trying to provide vaccines or other kind of care. All of that should also be on the same map. And with this kind of system, we can have an integrated approach to looking at public health. And this kind of work is happening currently in South Africa and other Southern African countries. And they have the goal of reducing uh, the transmission of malaria in the next few years by a great extent. Wade in the water. Wait in the water, children, wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Another fun example of activities we do in space comes from microgravity and human spaceflight. Now, the satellite cases can be kind of obvious. Obviously, it's useful to know what's happening in the environment, and it's useful to understand where people may need help during a disaster. But what are the benefits of sending people to live and work in space? Right now, we have the International Space Station as the main location where astronauts are living full time in space. They go for missions of about six months at a time, and people from a variety of countries gather there. The member countries include those from the United States, from Russia, from several countries in Europe, Canada, and Japan. But they also have guests from other countries that join them. Now, when the human body experiences microgravity, meaning when they're in orbit around the Earth and they're not affected directly by gravity, a few valuable things happen. First, we see the body undergoing changes because they're not fighting directly against the forces of gravity, and so our body changes in terms of our muscles and our bones. 
And it's useful because the astronauts are willing to let us take a lot of data about them while they're in space, which means we have very good measurements of how their body changes in many fronts. And these changes are very similar to aging quickly, meaning you see something similar in people on Earth who are experiencing osteoporosis or people who are in bed rest for a long period. So as astronauts share their data with us, we start to understand how we can have exercises or nutritional approaches that help them stay healthy, and those same effects can be used on Earth. Meanwhile, designing for astronauts to live in space, whether they're going around the Earth or traveling to a distant location like Mars, it always brings new innovation. These astronauts have to think about how they're going to have access to food and water and air to breathe and power, all are being highly constrained in terms of access to equipment and to volume. So a lot of innovations and inventions have come from these systems to keep astronauts alive in space, and many have been transferred already because organizations like NASA and other organizations around the world that are studying how we live in space, they also have teams whose job it is to find innovations from the space sector and transfer them to other fields. So you see, for example, techniques to filter water and give recycled water to astronauts have also been used already on Earth to transfer water that might not be safe to drink into water that can be clean. Similarly, there are techniques being studied now to figure out how to grow food, either for astronauts that are in a spacecraft or those living on a surface like Mars. As we study these topics, a lot of the innovations in improving the efficiency of farming can be directly transferred and are being tested on Earth as well. You can look online, for example, at NASA's spin-off website and see stories of techniques to improve the hydroponic growth of tomato plants on the space station. And that same technique is also being applied on the Earth. Similarly, there are questions of how to get the most nutrients per unit food that you grow for astronauts that might be living in a different place. And the same techniques, again, can be transferred to Earth. The lesson here is that when we consciously innovate for space and for Earth at the same time, we have the best opportunity to get that benefit back to people on Earth. If we only focus on the space needs, it's possible that, that benefit can be lost and just left in the space examples. It's important then also to ask who takes care of this technology transfer? Who can understand the needs, both from the point of view of the space activity and the development work? Follow the drinking gourd. Follow the drinking gourd. For the old man is waiting for to carry you to freedom. Follow the drinking gourd. People sometimes ask, what are the benefits of investing in fundamental scientific research? And they'll further ask whether all countries in the world should be investing in basic research, such as astronomy or astrophysics, because don't some of those countries have hungry people they need to feed? Well, I would first admit that we in the United States have hungry people that we need to feed, but we've also found it useful and important to the human experience to also spend some of our resources investing in basic research, because this is part of what makes us human, that we explore the deep questions about our environment and about our entire reality. What you see today is that countries around the world are increasing their investment in fundamental research, both for short-term benefit and for long-term. On one hand, they see it as part of their national innovation system, meaning they ask themselves, how are we going to ensure that we're a productive part of the global economy going forward? And one answer is to invest in basic research. On the other hand, countries want to advance the ability for humans in their community to be involved in their best possible ways to have a workforce that is working in science and technology. So they see that investment for long-term benefit as well. One great example I'd love to explore is the Square Kilometer Array Telescope. Has anyone heard of the Square Kilometer Array? Please look it up when you go home. I see one hand in the back, thank you. Uh, it's an exciting project that's going to bring the largest uh, radio-based telescope in the world to two continents. When I say radio-based, I mean that it's going to be a series of dishes located on several countries in Africa and Australia that will receive radio-based signals from other parts of the universe. And so will allow us to ask fundamental questions about what happened in the early period of the universe and study topics such as dark matter and dark energy that are still puzzles for us today. Now, what's exciting is I just came back from a visit to Ghana, which is one of the partner countries for the Square Kilometer Array. And I had a chance to be in Accra and to drive out to see this location where they've just inaugurated their SKA dish. They actually transformed previously a communication satellite dish into a radio telescope. And this means that people in Ghana can look up and see out of their window a large dish that's collecting data as part of an international network for basic research. 
And it means people from across the region are coming there to learn and train. And it's a new opportunity for people that might not have thought of themselves as future astronomers to know that that's part of their country's heritage and contribution. Meanwhile, as I mentioned earlier, many countries around the world are investing in their own national satellite programs, sometimes using these smaller satellites I talked about, but also investing in traditional communication satellites or being part of international projects for science. I've had the privilege in my research of sitting down with many leaders who are the early people to start their national satellite programs. So I've traveled in countries such as Malaysia and Thailand and Singapore and Vietnam. I've also been able to go in Africa to countries like South Africa and Nigeria, Kenya and Ghana. And in Latin America, you see a lot of activity in Mexico and Chile, Argentina and Brazil. All these countries are investing in national satellite programs with some government role, university role, and sometimes private companies as well. They're using these satellites to observe their environment. They're collaborating with international partners. They're exploring basic science. And again, it's because they see this technology and this scientific activity as part of their development process and as an investment into their innovation process. I've enjoyed hearing the courage of people who are the first in their country to say that we as a government should invest in space activity because it will help us solve important national problems. They often had to stand alone and really make this argument, but after they've had a chance to demonstrate it, many people join them. Francis E.W. Harper wrote, let me make the songs for the people, songs for the old and young, songs to stir like a battle cry wherever they are sung. Not for the clashing of sabers, nor carnage for strife, but songs to thrill the hearts of men with more abundant life. I'll share a few examples of the projects we are doing in our space-enabled research team at MIT. One example is thanks to the hospitality of a team in the West African country of Benin. I've had the privilege of being invited to visit there several times by a company called Greenkeeper Africa. I've also gotten to know people from the government and from universities, and I'm really getting to see the opportunities for that community to apply more and more technology from space as they address their own development goals. Now, first you need to know that the company called Greenkeeper Africa has their own innovation that's quite separate from space. They're concerned about an invasive plant called the water hyacinth. Who's seen a water hyacinth before? They're all over Florida, for example, and they're actually in 80 countries around the world. In West Africa, they're an invasive species, so they are not meant to be there. They were brought by a friendly neighborhood colonist, but they have now spread across uh, many waterways, and they cause a lot of harm, especially for communities that depend on water transport in order to access their food, their fishing, their access to markets, and to even basic clean water. Now, in these communities, uh, they have struggled in many ways to how to manage this invasive plant. Another concern that the companies noticed is that there are more and more industrial activities in the region, which is good for jobs, but also brings a challenge to dispose of industrial waste. Now, Greenkeeper Africa has found a clever innovation. They pay people from the local communities that live along the waterways to harvest the invasive plant. They bring that there and dry it and identify that they can use it as a dry, dried fiber, which is highly absorptive. And in fact, it actually absorbs very efficiently uh, the pollution and the toxic waste that comes from industrial activities, especially if it's oil-based waste. So in this case, they're able to transform an invasive plant into a product they can sell to companies who need to clean up this waste. I met the leaders of Greenkeeper Africa. I explained, just like I did to you, that I think technology from space can be useful in many communities. And they invited me to visit and now we're working on a research project to ask, can we work with them to design an online website that will give them an observatory of what's happening in their own region and their own lakes, but also around the West African region to see where this invasive plant is active and to make plans for future op operations. It turns out you can see these large clumps of the water hyacinth using satellite imagery. And we'll also apply aerial-based imagery from drones as well as water-based sensing to give them the best possible scientific information about the activity of the plant. And it's just the beginning of a longer term study to ask what can we see that's linking between uh, the food and water and energy systems in the region. And another example, we look at the microgravity case and we're using that to help us innovate new technologies. Earlier I talked about small satellites. Now, it's exciting that we have more and more of these small satellites going to space from companies and countries, but we do have a concern. If you think about the concern we have about plastic in the ocean, we know that people are dumping trash and it's creating a commons problem. Who's going to clean up the ocean? It's everybody's problem. Similarly, in space, when people put satellites in space, 
they operate for a while, and eventually they finish their lifetime, and at that point, they basically become trash. Now, some of these satellites will come naturally back down and be destroyed and be gone, which is good, but the longer they're up there after their life, useful operation, the more they create risk that other satellites will collide with them. And I do am excited about the opportunities for more companies and countries to put satellites in space, but I think we need new technology to ask, how can we bring them down out of orbit faster so they don't create more risk? We're exploring one technology that might be an idea. It means we want to ask what's an affordable material that anyone could put into their satellite to use as fuel, because the goal is basically to use some fuel and shoot yourself back toward the Earth as fast as possible at the end of the mission. One of my colleagues did his PhD at Stanford, and he had been studying the use of candle wax as a fuel for satellites. Now, this may sound unusual, but it turns out you can actually burn candle wax as a fuel, both for rockets and satellites. And we're now doing some basic research to find out what are the natures of this material, especially in the microgravity environment, and can it work as we hope, at the right geometries and the right textures, so it could be right in place to then burn as a fuel? And can anyone afford to use this very uh, non-toxic and affordable uh, available material and put a little bit in their satellite, even if they otherwise weren't planning to have a, a fancy propulsion and engine system. This is something we're exploring, and I'm, I'm excited to say we recently had an announcement where we had a chance to do an initial test, not in space, but almost in space. <laughs> if you can't afford to get all the way to space, one way you can do an experiment is to fly on a plane. And the planes go up very steeply and go over a, a kind of a hill and come down and go up again. And when you're at the very top of that hill, you get about 30 seconds of microgravity, meaning you can pretend your experiment's in space for about 30 seconds. So we did that recently and had our initial results. We'll continue this cycle. I'll give you guys an update next time I see you. But we're excited about this research and how it can help us determine whether this very affordable material, which could be available in any country around the world, could be used as a rocket fuel for small satellites. Other research we're exploring are asking questions, uh, what is the next generation of growing food for people living, for example, on the moon or on Mars? And how will that knowledge also help us to think about uh, improving life and food here on Earth? We've also been exploring the topic of Antarctica. This may sound strange, but Antarctica is kind of like the moon, meaning it's a distant place people don't usually go to, and it's very fragile, and a place that if humans operate a lot there, we'll change it a lot. It's also a place that belongs to all of us. We already have agreements across many countries that Antarctica is a place where no one country holds it, but everyone can share it. And we do have scientists going there every year doing research, and sometimes they're actually studying space because there are rocks that come and land in Antarctica that are easier to find in other places. People go there to explore how the rocks from space give us information about other planets, as well as how life in the very cold locations or places uh, that are otherwise very inhospitable to life can thrive. This can give us clues about possible life in other places. So we want to help people understand Antarctica and the important role it plays in both our community and our planet. And we think that we can do this through a museum exhibit that will help people understand what's happening in Antarctica today and get more ideas about the science. We also highly value learning from indigenous communities. Part of what you see in the science community is that uh, they tend to think that science is the only way to know anything or to measure anything. But of course, there are communities that are living in many of our most biodiverse places around the world, and we want to keep asking how we can use knowledge from satellites alongside knowledge from people that live in the most uh, endangered locations around the world in terms of biodiversity, and see how we can make both those kinds of information equally valuable and listen to them carefully. Phyllis Wheatley lived as a slave in Boston in the 1700s. I'll read briefly from her poem, On Imagination. Imagination, who can sing thy force? Or who describe the swiftness of thy course? Soaring through air to find the bright abode, the imperial palace of the thundering God. We on thy pinions can surpass the wind and leave the rolling universe behind. From star to star the mental optics rove, measuring the skies, and range the realms above. So what's coming next? Keep your eyes out for news from the space sector. There's a lot of changes happening right now. You're, as I said, you're seeing new participants. Many new countries or new companies are getting involved. And soon, over the next decade or so, you'll see some new business models that you hadn't heard before. Things that are usually happening on Earth might also happen in space. You know that we have these computer rooms that store a lot of our data and big servers. People are experimenting with this idea of putting those in space in the future. 
You may see new manufacturing techniques happening in space. You'll see more opportunities for tourists to travel to space and experience the view back looking at Earth. Now, all this is, of course, very exciting, but it means we need to also ask how we're going to coordinate with every country so everyone has equal access to these activities in space, but also so we don't create more space debris. It means that people like my team have a chance to kind of form a dialogue and really to start a movement. What I want to see is that kids on every country grow up asking themselves, what should, does it mean that space is the province of all humankind? What is my role as a citizen of Earth to help take care of our space environment? And how should humans live when we start our first communities on Mars? These are questions that every human really has a responsibility to think about, but most of us don't have time in our daily life to do so. But it's kids who are going to inherit our next generation of decisions. So I want to invite them to join us in thinking about this. Francis E.W. Harper wrote, Bury me in a free land. I would sleep, dear friends, where bloated might can rob no man of his dearest right. My rest shall be calm in any grave where none can call his brother a slave. We still have some work to do to achieve these goals. We still have some work to do to ensure that space technology is truly accessible and a community of equals. So my team is asking, what does it mean for us to design systems using technology from space that are truly anti-racist, that don't bring any social hierarchy in them? We think it has to do with the materials we use, like this paraffin wax is affordable. It has to do with the way we interact with our partners, as well as the actual designs of the systems we put together. But we need help from people like you that are going to also help us decide what does development mean in each community. So I hope you'll join me for this adventure, because there's a lot of work to be done. Lord, I done done, I done done what you told me to do. Lord, I done done, I done done what you told me to do. Lord, you told me to pray, I done done of that too. Lord, I done done, I done done what you told me to do. Lord, you told me to sing, I done done that too. Lord, I done done, I done done what you told me to do. Lord, you told me to sing, I done done that too. Uh, first question, have you reserved your seat on the SpaceX trip? And secondly, is Vice President Pence heading up some sort of a cooperative effort? Thank you. I do look forward to going to space one day. I have applied in the past for the traditional of trying to become an astronaut through NASA. I don't have enough money myself to pay for my own personal tourist trip. Maybe the cost will come down. It, you know, it's been in the tens of millions, maybe down to the hundreds of millions, or down to, the, say, um, hundreds of thousands just for a trip up to see this Earth and come back. I'm still, it's not, not quite on my pay scale. <laughs> but when the price comes down to maybe thousands, I'll certainly consider it. One day we would ask, can we buy a ticket to space in the way we buy a ticket on a plane to go across the world? But we're not quite there yet, but it could happen in our lifetime. I won't speak too much about international politics, it's just to say that we do see some key questions being asked by the federal government, which are useful, asking what does it mean in the next generation of how we're going to manage uh, what traffic goes to space, meaning we currently have a system for air traffic that's internationally coordinated activity. So when you fly on a flight that goes from the US to London, there's a lot of coordination that's already been in place to figure out how to coordinate across national boundaries. We don't have the same thing for space. Right now, and traditionally, We've had the benefit that actually the US Air Force plays a public service. They track all the satellites that are in space now, and they provide a free service to anyone who asks to provide information if there's a risk of one satellite hitting another, which is very useful. So there are discussions happening now, among many discussions, in the US government to say, uh, long term, who should have the right tools and funding to do that work? It could be done by other parts of the US government, and there are rational discussions happening around what the best way is to do that. And if also involves other governments and the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs. Hear me? And they have a 
of all the satellites that have been modeled. All this is ongoing collaboration. It's been going on for decades, but we're seeing some extra work now because we're noticing that uh, there's a goal for more countries and companies to put many satellites in space, maybe thousands more. Opportunity, but it also needs more coordination. So that's one of many things happening. Thanks for the question. I see a hand here. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, a few years ago, I was living in New York, and I'm going to say a little bit of a story that I don't actually remember the full details, but a friend that's an investment uh, was working with this company that was um, using satellite images for microfinancing. And so in some countries, when it's hard to prove your land rights or how your land's been performing for farming, um, you know, then they could use retrospective data and then provide microfinancing and loans. Um, so I found it fascinating. This was like three years ago, and when I heard about your talk, I was kind of curious about it. So, you know, just I'm going to say this scenario, and you can tell me if you think it's feasible or not. So it would be great, and perhaps we're closer than we think we are in an environment where, say, there's banks offering this type of loans on a broader scale, uh, or perhaps every public health department has access to satellite images for prevention of epidemiological concerns, et cetera, et cetera. What, at the time, I remember asking my friend, and I still don't know about, is what's the agency that regulates this, and how does it, like, is there a business model? Like, how does this happen? Because it sounds, you know, after hearing your talk, that we may be not incredibly far from that, um, but I don't know, you know, what the agency is, the business models, and anything you have to say around that. I see. Thank you so much for the question. Let me give some background information that I think will speak to your question. First thing to know is that I mentioned this idea that we can take observation of the Earth from space using satellites. And I need to clarify a few points because there's multiple ways to observe. Um, you may be most familiar with the kind of pictures you can see, for example, on Google, where you can see a picture of your house or other buildings, right? So this means that a satellite had basically a camera on it that's similar to what your cell phone has, meaning it's the same kind of sensor. It collects light that is the same kind of light our eyes see in red and blue and green. So there's a lot of commercial collection of this kind of data that's not necessarily freely shared, but it is available. It can be bought by a company to use for another business. Meanwhile, NASA and our United States Geological Survey on the US side, but also European organizations, they also operate imagery satellites with images on them, like cameras. And they produce data through the Landsat series of satellites and through some called Sentinel. And they produce free data. Now, it, sometimes the difference is the level of detail. So in this case, Landsat means one pixel in the image is about 30 meters. So imagine you couldn't see a detailed car, but you could see a field. And often that data is very useful for these kinds of topics but more so when the agricultural areas are larger. For a very small farm owned by one family that may be less than 30 meters wide, it wouldn't be as useful, but you could see for the region what's happening. So in that case, I'd say there's already actually large amounts of free data that's imagery. There's actually 40 years of history of satellite data provided by the Landsat series. Now, meanwhile, NASA, for example, operates about 20 other kinds of satellites, and it would take a long time to describe them all because each is different. They have different kinds of sensors, and they measure particular aspects of the atmosphere, or the land, or the water, or the ice. They could be measuring, for example, rainfall and snowfall using microwave um, measurements. Or they might be looking at soil moisture, or the way the ice is changing in the poles, or measuring things like uh, what's happening in terms of the ocean color or ocean temperature. Now, this data is available for free to everyone. However, the challenge becomes that it actually it's designed for researchers that have a PhD in some earth science field. It's posted online for free, and you can go download it, but I don't recommend it because downloading the data directly is kind of confusing. When you get, just get a file full of numbers, it's not really answering a question for anyone. The next step, then, is to put it into a model that might be trying to estimate something, like what's the likelihood that we'll have healthy crops in this area, or are we going to see a certain kind of storm form? Again, that's the, the role of people with science at PhD level. Then after that, you'd ask, well, can someone take that interesting science result and turn it into business-ready information or operational information? So the way we have it designed in the US, the government says, we provide the underlying data for free, all this earth science data, and we would encourage companies to start this activity, so there's little bits of funding from the government through the Small Business Innovative Research Program, where companies can apply for funding to get started using this free data as part of their business. But really, it requires a lot of knowledge. That's part of what motivates our team. We would like to say, in the future, 
can it be easier, both affordable and easier, <laughs> to use this interesting complex data for business? It does happen. A lot of people have formed companies with people who do understand the earth science and the business, and they bring it together and they create interesting businesses. But I think we'll see it more as we find new ways to reduce the barriers to entry with this kind of data. Thanks for the question. I'll let our stage manager tell us who's going to ask next. One over here. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering if you might speak to your unusual presentation style. I was really um, moved by you know, how you incorporated um, music and humming and singing. I found it very powerful. It gave um, a real emotional and spiritual context for science, which typically we've been you know, taught that these are opposing ideas. And it makes me um, think of, you know, tradition of knowledge sharing, perhaps included singing to kind of share. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if you might speak to that. Thank you. Thank you for asking. I was hoping someone would ask why I sang during a science talk. Thank you. <laughs> um, I have to say that the planning for this talk started when I asked where am I speaking? And as soon as I realized where I was speaking, it started to affect my plans for what to do. I looked online to say, what is this place? And what will it feel like to be in it? I often speak in churches, and I've often been someone who's read, for example, the passage from scripture uh, on a Sunday service. And when I do that, I try to think of it not as a performance, but as a, the experience of living in the words. And there's also many traditions of, of singing scripture as part of the reading. So when I realized I'd be here today with you all, I thought, why not bring some of that element into the talk? I grew up in a church that uh, sang mostly a cappella music. And we sang lots of gospel songs, some that were in the book that was the traditional, actually, oh my gosh, it's the same one, very similar to this, very similar to the, the uh, music books you see here. We had those. We also had songs that were being written in real time by our community, meaning uh, some weeks we would gather together and say, oh, Sister Veronica, she's got a new song. We're all gonna learn this song now. So we were creating new music together while also enjoying the traditions of many generations. So this is an important part of my heritage. And I realized that the story I wanted you all to know requires that knowledge, meaning it's not just that I want you to know that I build satellites. I want you to know that I build satellites and there is work to be done to ensure that space as an example of technology is truly open to everyone. And I think the music helped us get across. Thank you for asking. We have a question towards the back. Has there been any curtailment in funding to do this satellite research um, under the current political climate that both denies science and isn't worried about the uh, environment? Thank you for asking, because um, I'll just give you my background so I can show my biases. Uh, previous to working at the MIT, as I do now, I had a chance to work at NASA, uh, both first uh, for the previous administrator, so NASA's lead person is called the administrator. So I had a chance to work in the team that was at the over of the agency, as well as working in the Earth Science team. So I have a view on both of those points. It's true that uh, there was some concern going into the current administration uh, that some of the funding for things that are called climate uh, would be targeted. I should give you some background, which is that NASA's budget is about $20 billion per year. This is a very US answer, right? Uh, and of that $20 billion, about $8 billion goes into human spaceflight, which helps us operate on the International Space Station. And NASA's also building the biggest rocket ever right now. So that's about $8 billion. About $6 billion goes to science, and that includes studying the Earth, studying all the planets going around our sun and the asteroids and moons, as well as studying our sun itself and then all the other parts of the universe. That's about $6 billion. It operates about 100 satellites. So the main good news is that that $6 billion is still intact, approximately, and it's sort of growing naturally over the last couple of years, with inflation, you could say. Uh, meanwhile, about $2 billion of that is actually just for the Earth. So we say we study everything, and the majority is actually for the Earth in terms of planets you know, per unit money. <laughs> so we still study the Earth. All the, there's many satellites still studying and operating the Earth. There's thousands of, sci of scientists, both inside NASA, but also at universities who are still funded. I'm pleased to say I just received a grant from NASA, actually, to do this kind of work in partnership with our team in Benin and Ghana. So we do have a chance to uh, see university funding. There have been particular examples of missions where the White House team has proposed uh, canceling them. And actually, then the Congress team comes back and says, no, no, these are still important, so they stay. So there has been some debate and tension. But I have to say I'm pleasantly surprised with, with how much things are still intact in terms of NASA's science budget. 
Thank you for asking. We have, we have time for one more question. Thank you very much. Can you tell us about the image that's been projected? Sure, thank you. I didn't explain, but I did feel like it might communicate some of the um, feeling I was thinking. So the picture here, the credit goes to NASA and to the US Geological Survey. It's actually a satellite image, a satellite image that's uh, taken through the Landsat satellite. And it's showing a region in Kenya near Tanzania, which is showing Mount Kilimanjaro. And the colors are somewhat through artistic license, meaning anytime you have a satellite image, you have to ask how to map all the information that comes back from the electronics into color. So there's always a choice being made there. And here it's not directly natural color. It's more like color that emphasizes the altitude and the different regions you're looking at. Now, the reason I wanted to show Mount Kilimanjaro is because of part of my history. Early on when I was studying aerospace engineering at MIT as an undergraduate, I knew I wanted to work in some way in the space field, but I also felt a tug to do something in my life that linked to serving young girls. So I spent several summers and some uh, school breaks volunteering at a school in Kenya, just inside of this view, meaning I, I didn't see from space, but I saw Mount Kilimanjaro in the distance. And I used to go uh, every year or so and spend time with about 50 girls, and we'd be singing and, and teaching together and looking at English and math lessons. And I was asking myself, I'm learning to build satellites, but does that have anything to do with life here in Kenya? And for some reason I didn't know, I thought that I would probably need to quit doing NASA work or science work in order to have an impact in this community in Kenya. But gradually I would, I've come to see that actually technology from space does play a great role in every country, including Kenya, and that there are scientists in Kenya who are experts in how to use data from satellites to support their own development. When I learned that, I had this great aha moment that I could actually continue to work with uh, leadership and partners from governments like those in Kenya, but also work in the space. And that's why I'm so happy to be with you today that this connection has been made between space and development in every country. So thank you for asking. I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. A big round of applause for our presenter. Thank you for attending the Chicago Humanities Festival.